Welcome to Bed Crime Stories Podcast. I'm your host, T. To my bed crimers, I hope you guys are all well. To anyone new here, a warm welcome. Thank you for checking out my channel. If after listening to or watching this video, you find you enjoyed it, please do me a favor, smash that like button. It's a free way you can help me. Now, let's get started. This is episode four of the Dyatlov Incident, the strange injuries of the remaining four hikers. After five of the hikers from the Dyatlov expedition are found frozen in the snow, and as four more remain missing, theories and rumors abound about what led to their tragic ending. Some people are speculating that the indigenous Manzai tribes people may be responsible for the hikers' deaths. Perhaps they were shadowing the nine hikers during their expedition and attacked them for treading in the Manzai's sacred lands. That rumor is quickly quelled by logic. First, there's no evidence of Manzai tracks and reindeer hooves behind the hikers. It would appear that no one was trailing the student hikers. Second, the Manzai are well known for taking lost people into their homes and providing them with food. They're also a harmonious people who don't seek out trouble. Third, the area where the hikers were traveling holds no special religious significance for the Manzai. So that is a theory that you can put to rest. While rumors agitate, several other activities relating to the nine hikers are occurring. One, searchers are continuing to scour the snow-covered landscape near where the tent and the other five bodies were found. They're looking for Layuda Dubenina, Sasha Zolotarov, Kolya Thibault Brignol, and Alexander Kolovatov. Two, an investigation by the prosecutor's office in Evedel is ongoing. They're determined to find out what led to the hikers' deaths. Three, back in Sverdlovsk, the hikers' families are grieving the loss of their young ones and trying to figure out who at the Ural Polytechnic Institute signed off on this dangerous expedition. And four, the bodies of the first hikers found, that of Yuri Doroshenko, Georgi, Igor Dyatlov, the expedition leader, and Zina Kolmogorova, are undergoing autopsies in Evedel. The autopsies take place on March 4th and are completed by a regional forensic pathologist and a city medical examiner. The consensus is that all four hikers succumbed to hypothermia, meaning they froze to death. Doroshenko has pulmonary edema and a pulmonary contusion from blunt trauma. Pulmonary edema is swelling in the lungs due to excess fluid. A pulmonary contusion is a bruise of the lung that causes bleeding and swelling. The diagnosis of this internal injury was made through an x-ray. As for what caused it, they cannot say. Generally, such injuries result from a severe blow to the chest, and you'd normally see this type of injury in a car crash. Doroshenko was found face down in the snow under a 25-foot tall cedar tree. It looked as though he'd been climbing the tree for firewood when he fell from a high distance likely due to a brittle bough breaking. Witnesses at the scene said that all the lower branches of the cedar tree were broken off. Doroshenko's ears, lips, and nose are covered in blood. In addition, his upper lip is swollen. He has a number of bruises on his arms, one under his right armpit, and his hair is burned on the right side of his head. According to Doroshenko's sister, who was in the seventh grade when her brother died, their mother came back from seeing his body, saying that he and his clothes were orange. 
but in the autopsy report, his complexion is described as brown-purple. Note that Doroshenko, if he had survived that night, would have had to have all his toes and fingers amputated due to severe frostbite. Death, per the pathologist, occurred six to eight hours after his last meal. It's hard to know if Doroshenko had had a chance to eat his dinner before whatever event happened that sent him fleeing from the tent. So that last meal may have been his lunch or his dinner. So perhaps he was alive from 9 p.m. until anywhere between 3 a.m. and 5 a.m. It also appears that sometime after Doroshenko's blood stopped circulating, someone turned him over. Whoever did that did it in a gentle, caring manner so it was likely one of the other hikers. Is it possible the other hikers, finding Doroshenko deceased, removed whatever clothing they could from him to help themselves stay alive? Could that explain why he was wearing so few items of clothing? Georgie, whose body was found lying right next to Doroshenko, face up with a knee up, bit off a piece of his own knuckle. Did he do that to try and stay away or to stifle a cry? That's part of the mystery. In addition, Georgie has third-degree burns, likely from the fire the two comrades had going for about two hours before they died. Skin on the backs of his hands is torn and there's blood between the fingers. The index finger is also torn as is the skin on his left shin. Georgie's body also appears to have been moved by his comrades and placed next to Doroshenko's. Thus, it would appear that Georgie and Doroshenko died before the other hikers. Igor Dyatlov is found about 300 meters from that 25-foot-tall cedar tree. He is face up with his head pointing in the direction of the tent. Igor is wearing an unbuttoned fur sleeveless vest. Strange that it's unbuttoned when it was freezing cold that night. He's also wearing a blue sweater and a long-sleeved red cotton shirt with pockets. Note that one of the pockets contains four anti-inflammatory pills used to help heal infected wounds. He also sports a blue sleeveless cotton singlet, ski pants over his pants, and no shoes. He had one cotton sock on his left foot and one wool sock on his right, and he was vomiting blood before he died. Igor also had minor abrasions to his forehead, upper eyelids, cheeks, left eyebrow, and ankles. His knees are also bruised, and he has dried blood on his lips and purple-gray discoloration on the back side of his right hand. He also has bruises on the joints of his right hand. The left hand is purple-brown in color, and there are superficial wounds on the second and fifth finger of the left hand. There are no internal injuries and the pathologist rules his cause of death as hypothermia. Xena is discovered 630 meters from the cedar tree, face down, with her head pointed toward the tent. The skin on her face and hands is purple red. She's dressed in more layers than Doroshenko, Georgie, and Igor. She has on two hats, a long sleeve undershirt, a sweater, a checkered shirt, and another sweater with a torn cuff on the right sleeve. She was wearing the sweaters inside out, which is not unusual for mountaineers. They do this to try to dry the sweaters. Zena is also wearing cotton sports pants, another pair of pants, ski pants, and three pairs of socks. Like the other hikers, she has no shoes on. Five rubles are found in her pocket, and a military-style protective mask is on the left side of her chest. Zena also has a large baton-shaped bruise on her waist. Her cause of death is noted as hypothermia. Rustik Slobodan's body 
is found 480 meters from the cedar tree. His face was down, and his head was oriented toward the tent. He's better dressed than the other four hikers. He's wearing a long sleeve undershirt, a shirt, a sweater, two pairs of pants, four pairs of socks, and one felt boot on his right foot. He has 310 rubles in a pocket along with his passport. In the other pocket, he carries a pen knife, a pencil, a pen, a comb, a box of matches, and one cotton sock. During Rustique's autopsy on March 8th, the pathologist discovers a fracture on his frontal bone. It looks as though someone hit him hard in the head. Rustique also has a variety of abrasions on his forehead, hemorrhages in the temporalis muscles, a brown-red bruise on the upper eyelid of the right eye with a hemorrhage in the underlying tissue, traces of blood discharge from the nose, swelling and abrasions on both sides of his face, bruised knuckles, bruising on his left arm and palm, swollen lips, and torn skin on his right forearm. How did Rustique end up with a fractured skull? The autopsy notes state that after the initial shock of the first blow, Rustique likely suffered a loss of coordination that could have sped up his death from hypothermia. Throughout the rest of March and all of April, the search continues in the northern Urals for the remaining four hikers. The searchers fan out from the 25-foot-tall cedar tree where the first five hikers' bodies were found. The snow is still incredibly deep, and the wind continues to howl. On May 3rd, a full four months after the hikers went missing, the Manzai tribesman, Stefan Kurikov, who continues to search, notices some strange branches under the snow. It's in a ravine, not far from the cedar tree. The branches look like they've been cut by a knife. Searchers are sent out to the area to probe the snow. On the first day, six yards from the branches, a searcher finds an item of clothing. The searchers then grab shovels and start digging a large hole above the creek bed. Eventually, the hole becomes eight feet deep, and it covers more than a hundred feet. It's basically a large trench or den that was made by the remaining four members of the Dyatlov group. It's about 70 to 75 meters from that cedar tree. The den would have offered the hikers some shelter from the cold wind. It is likely ex-military man Sasha came up with the idea. There are cedar branches on the bottom of the den that were likely placed there to minimize contact of the bodies with the cold snow below. Later that day, searchers find a heap of clothing, but no bodies. Some of the clothing appears to be cut and shredded. The next day, the search of the ravine continues. More clothing is found. It's not until evening that the searchers hit something hard. It turns out to be the body of a man. However, because of the degree of decomposition, it's impossible to know which of the missing hikers it is. The body is at the creek bottom, where the snow was slushy and wet. This is what led to all the decomposition. The parts of the body that were in the melting snow are more decomposed than the parts that aren't. This male is wearing a gray sweater and two watches. It's not long before Lyuda's body is found. She's on her knees, with her face and chest pressed against rock. Her arms rest on a rock ledge. She's wearing a short sleeve shirt, a long sleeve shirt, and two sweaters. One of the sweaters is brown, and according to Yuri Yudin, it belonged to Georgie. Lyuda's also dressed in underwear, long socks, 
and two pairs of pants. The outer pair of pants is badly burned and torn. Layuda also sports a hat and two pairs of warm socks. It appears that she took off a sweater and cut it into two pieces. One half she wrapped around her left foot. Another half she left or accidentally dropped in the snow. Sasha Zolotarov is also found in the ravine. He's wearing two hats, a scarf, a long sleeve shirt, a black sweater, and a coat with its two upper buttons unbuttoned. The lower part of his body is protected by underwear, two pairs of pants, and a pair of ski pants. His feet are protected by a pair of socks and a pair of warm leather handmade shoes. He also has a camera around his neck. Yuri Yudin will later say that it was a complete surprise to hear Sasha had an extra camera with him. Unfortunately, the film in the camera was damaged from melting water, so they were not able to process it. Sasha is also found holding a pen in one hand and a notepad in the other. Sadly, nothing is written on the paper. What did Sasha want to write? Was he planning to tell future searchers who would inevitably go out to look for them what happened that night? We'll never know. Next, we move to Alexander Kolovatov. Alexander and Sasha are found spooning as if Kolovatov was trying to warm Sasha. Kolovatov was well insulated when he died. The only things he was missing were a hat and shoes. His body is found wearing a sleeveless shirt, a long sleeve shirt, a sweater, another sweater made of fleece, and a ski jacket with its zipper unzipped. Once again, you'd think he would have zipped it up since it was so cold that night. His ski jacket is damaged with a big hole on the left sleeve and burnt edges. His right sleeve is also damaged with several tears. He's also wearing shorts, light pants, ski pants, and another pair of canvas pants over all of that. He's carrying a key, a safety pin, some blank paper, two packages of pills, and matches that are soaking wet, likely from being in the slush. His right foot sports a light sock below a woolen one. He also has a bandage around his ankle, which looks like it may have been sprained before whatever catastrophic event drove him and his comrades fleeing from the tent. And finally, we move on to Nikolai Thibault Prignol, otherwise known as Kolya. Kolya is found wearing more clothing than most of the other hikers. Some have speculated that he and Sasha might have been outside the tent when whatever catastrophic event drove the hikers from its warmth. Kolya is wearing a canvas fur hat and a home-knitted wool one. He also is wearing a shirt, a wool sweater worn inside out, and a sheepskin fur jacket. In the jacket's pockets are three coins, a comb, and several pieces of paper. The lower part of his body is protected by underwear, sweatpants, cotton pants, and ski pants. His feet boast hand-knitted wool socks and a pair of felt boots. He also has two watches on his left arm. One stopped working at 8.14 and the other at 8.39. The bodies are pulled out of the ravine and wrapped in tarps. They need to be flown to Evedel immediately for autopsy because they are rapidly decomposing. Note that if you want to see photos of the bodies in the snow and when placed on examination tables, they can be found on a website called diatlofpass.com. A warning though, the images are graphic and disturbing. The pathologist finds the following when examining Layuda's body. The soft tissue around her eyes and her eyeballs are missing. Her left cheekbone 
is partially exposed. In addition, her nose cartilage is broken and flattened, and the soft tissue of her upper lip is gone. But here's the strangest detail of all. Her tongue is completely gone. Now where she was found, the snow was melting and slushy, and there was marine life from the riverbed. So it's possible her tongue was eaten away by marine life. It could have also just decomposed. Layuda also has many broken ribs, a massive hemorrhage in her heart's left atrium, and a bruise in the middle of her left thigh. The pathologist lists Layuda's cause of death as a hemorrhage into the right atrium of the heart, multiple fractured ribs, and internal bleeding. And he concludes she died 10 to 20 minutes after enduring whatever blow caused all these injuries. Sasha's eyes are also missing like Layuda's, and the soft tissue around his left eyebrow is also missing. An open wound on the right side of his skull shows exposed bone. On his chest, there are five broken ribs. He has hemorrhaging into the cardiac muscle with more hemorrhaging into the pleural cavity. This suggests that he was alive when he sustained the injury. Some say the injury is such that it may have been caused by a bomb's shockwave. Alexander Kolovatov has that bandage around his left ankle. It is determined that whatever injury happened to that happened before this catastrophic event sent them fleeing from the tent. And this is because the hiker's first aid kit is found inside the tent. The soft tissue around his eyes is missing. His eyebrows are curiously missing as well, and his skull bones are exposed. The base of his nose is flattened and his nostrils compressed. This could mean his nose was broken, but it might not mean that. He also has an open wound behind his right ear. His neck is snapped in such a way that some think he may have been in a physical fight. However, these injuries could also have occurred because the body was exposed to the elements for four long months. He has diffuse bleeding in the underlying tissue of his left knee, and overall his skin color is gray-green with a tinge of purple. And finally, we come to Kolia. He has multiple severe fractures to the temporal bone in his skull. A bruise on the upper lip on the left side and hemorrhaging on the lower right forearm. The damage to Kolia's head could have been the result of his body being thrown into the ravine, or he could have fallen in it, and his head hit the rocks. The ravine is 25 feet below the land. That's a long way to fall. Remember, it was pitch black out there when the hikers fled the tent. After sustaining this head injury, Kolia would have been unconscious. It's possible, though, that he could have shown signs of life for two to three hours. Next time on the Dyatlov incident, we'll talk about the various theories that have been floated about over the past 64 years as to what caused these nine hikers to flee the security of the tent. I hope you'll join me for that. Until the next time on Bed Crime Stories.